Welcome again to the Chicago Tradition and Architecture Inspiration or Artifact. I'm Kim Coventry, Executive Director of the Richard H. Dree House Foundation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the foundation and were not here last night, uh, it was established 32 years ago by Richard Dree House. Under his guidance and that of the Board of Directors, the foundation has distributed more than $100 million, most of it to Chicago organizations. Today, the foundation works in four areas, the largest of which is focused on the built environment. This symposium is directed at the aspect of our mission that aims to preserve and improve Chicago's historic fabric and to ensure that it continues to resonate and thereby inform who we are in perpetuity. And I have to say this morning, uh, coming up uh, uh, to the club, I looked at this beautiful wall of traditional buildings with the sun coming in on it, and I um, had a deep, deep uh, affection for what I saw. Among other initiatives to improve the built environment, we support those that preserve and reinforce sense of place, a complex multi-sensory phenomenon which we all experience when we recognize that a given place is special and particular as opposed to being merely a location. Last night, in his keynote address, Bob Brugman pointed out that the Chicago tradition in architecture is not a monolithic one. Rather, it comprises several strands. Bob identified five. One, the 19th century landscape planning tradition that produced the Chicago Park System. Two, the commercial building tradition responsible for the first integrated steel frame buildings in the loop. Three, the tradition of residential neighborhood and monumental public buildings at the turn of the 20th century. Four, work between the wars that modernized the Western architectural tradition without throwing out the basic principles. And five, a set of post-war buildings that radically modified or discarded traditional building hierarchies and symbolic language. To paraphrase Bob, which is dangerous, um, he argued that what binds these multiple strands together and what makes them all characteristic of Chicago is that architects working in each tradition were consistently willing and able to respond to their clients' needs as well as those of the larger society. In other words, Chicago architecture has been consistently both pragmatic and public. The search for more particular patterns will be the focus of today's talks. How has Chicago architecture been both pragmatic and public spirited? How should it be? If Bob's talk last night supplied the raw material for Chicago's architectural traditions by defining them, Today, we're going to focus on interpreting and, represent and responding to this raw material. This morning, we'll hear two ways to interpret Chicago's architectural legacy, which we can imagine as two different design approaches an architect working in the Chicago tradition might take. We'll also hear a talk about whether this kind of direct engagement with the local architectural legacy is even possible or plausible in the globalized context in which architects are working today. A few um, housekeeping uh, matters. Uh, if you are hoping to receive AIA credits for uh, the, today's program, you should be sure and sign up um, out by the registration desk. And um, we uh, will have a couple of breaks today, and uh, I hope you'll be prompt in getting back uh, to your seats so we can stay on schedule. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker. Um, Stuart Cohn is an architect, historian, and teacher. Stuart is the right person to get us started because it is at least partly through his efforts that we understand the Chicago tradition in architecture 
as more than the architecture of Mies van der Rohe and his supposed antecedents in the early tall buildings of the Loop. In 1976, Stewart organized the exhibition Chicago Architects as a response to the Museum of Contemporary Arts exhibition on Chicago architecture, which focused largely on Mies van der Rohe. Through the work of traditional Chicago architects, the exhibition showed that the city's architectural legacy extends beyond the modern canon. Stewart has continued to explore this legacy in a series of books on the houses of Chicago and the North Shore, including his recent book on Howard Van Doren Shaw. He has also put his legacy to use in his own work. Together with Julie Hacker, his wife and business partner, Stewart has designed Chicago houses that have been published here and abroad and are the subject of a book published in 2009. Stewart recently served on the jury of the uh, foundation-funded competition for a new building in Pullman. And um, I can tell you, he deployed in full force some of the arguments that you will hear today. This morning, Stuart will discuss a Chicago tradition of characteristic forms. Let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, Kim, thank you for the nice introduction. Richard, thank you for uh, throwing this wonderful event. And um, uh, lastly, Sam, thank you for organizing this. We were sort of comparing notes, and it turns out that Sam has, at least in his mind, all of this choreographed. So each of us got a uh, title for our talk, and mine was uh, Chicago Tradition of Characteristic Form, and I confess that I have no idea what that means. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, happy to be invited to the party like a good dinner guest at a potluck event. Uh, I was asked to bring the vegetables, so I'm certainly not going to bring dessert. So, okay, how do I start? Great. So. Uh, if we're talking about a tradition of characteristic uh, Chicago forms, the uh, thing that comes to mind that Chicago is best known for, of course, is the Chicago frame. But it's worth pointing out that the idea of uh, an architecture whose form is generated by its structure or by the expression of its structure has actually been a major idea for architecture for millennia now. So we're looking at that temple at Paestum on, uh, on the left and the Chancelleria on the right, which is, is in fact another way to, to think about form. And here it's been applied basically to the surface as a uh, organizational device rather than a real representation of the way the building has been built. Uh, having said that, I don't think there's much more that I feel I have to say about uh, structure as a determinant of architectural form. So what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, uh, other kinds of Chicago traditions with respect to arch Chicago's contribution to architecture and Chicago's contribution to American urbanism. And what I've done is to uh, actually set up some, as Bob did yesterday, set up some categories. So I want to talk about the idea of structure aestheticized and then space actualized. If those are somewhat opaque, hopefully they'll be clearer as I move through my lecture, and then also to talk about the idea of traditional urbanism in uh, Chicago with respect to American urbanism, and then what I'm calling skyscraper urbanism. So the two images are postcards of Chicago, uh, one obviously of the Hancock building, and the other uh, an image sent to me by my friend Christian Buni, which actually places Burnham's uh, City Hall uh, in its location, which currently positions it over the uh, circle interchange. So uh, it, it, Bob, Bob talked about this a little bit yesterday, and it's been the position of a lot of our, us that Chicago's tradition, as represented by European historians, has been both misrepresented and uh, mythologized. And the myth, basically, is that Chicago's early commercial buildings uh, were exclusively about the expression of the building's structure. So the first thing I want to talk about is what I'm calling uh, structure aestheticized. And 
on the left-hand side is the iconic image of William the Baron Jenny's uh, fair store uh, under construction, where we see uh, the, the actual steel frame. And on the right-hand side is Jenny's first lighter building. And we can see some of the problems here. What Jenny has chosen to do is, is to actually represent the frame, which is discontinuous, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, he's also uh, made the uh, uh, top of the building the same dimension as the other spandrels, uh, uh, which may in fact represent the way in which they calculated the floor road, load and the roof load, but certainly the, uh, the effect isn't, leaves something to be desired show, aesthetically, shall we say. Uh, my favorite Chicago frame building is in fact Jenny's second lighter building, which actually does some uh, pretty interesting and sophisticated things. The, uh, the horizontals are suppressed, the verticals run all the way to the top. There is, in fact, a capping element. But then if you look at the lower slides, which, which detail the breakdown of the grids within grids, you can see that, in, that, that there's a larger reading of the, uh, of the grids with a sort of secondary breakdown uh, and then in those sections, the uh, spandrel is actually uh, suppressed. And then I'm not sure the history of this building, but at some point, uh, based on the old image and the newer images, which are the two below, uh, the lower windows were replaced. And the effect, which I absolutely love, is one of a greater visual density to the bottom of the building. And then if you look at the original, uh, uh, image of the postcard on the top, there always had been a different modulation or a different breakdown of the windows that went into the top band to actually form an attic below the cornice, all of which are, uh, I think, in this context, classical gestures, modulating the idea of the frame as, ex as expressed. Uh, the whole idea of the tall building being something special and something special to Chicago is actually uh, uh, found in Lou Sullivan's writings. And he says, and I think I can almost read it on this screen here, uh, in the tall office building artistically considered, what is the chief characteristic of the tall office building? And at once we answer, it is lofty. And then in the autobiography of an idea, he writes, the architects of Chicago welcome the steel frame. The appeal and the inspiration lie, of course, in the element of loftiness, in the suggestion of slenderness and aspiration, the soaring quality of the thing rising from the earth as a unitary utterance. So when we actually get to the question of how to deal with structural frame, I love the sort of juxtaposition of Mies van der Rohe's apartment buildings, 860-880 and 900-910. And in the 868-80 buildings, Mies actually expresses the frame, which you can see. And the problem is that if you set the mullions or curtain wall stiffeners on the center line of the columns and then space them equally across the facade, you get the situation in which the outboard windows are actually narrower than the two central windows because they're, uh, they're, they're compressed by the actual uh, represented face of the column. Uh, this is aesthetically unacceptable in what Mies does when he builds a, a 900, 910 next door is to suppress the reading of the columns and simply give us a curtain wall with uh, accentuated vertical mullions, which again, for me at least, harks back to this idea that Sullivan has presented that the chief characteristic of the tall building is that it is lofty. Of course, probably the iconic version of the Chicago frame and the Chicago window is to be found in Lou Sullivan's Carson Perry Scott building. And of course, we're talking about the center section of the building. The base of the building, as you all know, has this wonderful uh, elaborate uh, cast iron ornament. And the dichotomous nature of those two, two ideas about architecture actually is wonderful because it shows up in Nicholas Pevsner's uh, Pioneers of Modern Design in the following way. The 
middle of Sullivan's building is discussed in the chapter on the development of the steel frame and the Chicago skyscrapers, and the bottom of the building Pevsner discusses in a chapter on Art Nouveau. Well, what could be more ridiculous than to suggest that somehow Sullivan is, is related to the Art Nouveau movement when what we all know is that Sullivan is basically influenced by Richardson and he is a Romanesque architecture. And the images we're looking at here on the left-hand side are, uh, is from John Ruskin and he's talking about the a variety of ornamentation that's possible for the capital of a Romanesque uh, column. The center image is from H.H. H. Richardson's Albany uh, City Hall, and then the last image is from Lou Sullivan's uh, auditorium building. And then, uh, if that's not convincing enough, the sequence of images here are the uh, Richardson's, or H.H. H. Richardson's Marshall Fields Warehouse Building in Chicago, which Bob talked about, and then uh, Sullivan's homage to that building, uh, the Walker Warehouse, and then the Auditorium Building, and Sullivan's Synagogue. Uh, so it would seem that when not faced with commercial constraints uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, restrictions for building a stripped down loft building that Sullivan basically for more important and more civic buildings uh, moves to uh, the American or the Richardsonian Romanesque. Uh, of course, if we go back to that article that I quoted earlier, the tall office building artistically considered, Sullivan proposes that the tall office building is like a column, that it's made up of a based base, a shaft, and a capital, and that the shaft is simply repetitive windows of unitary offices, all of which should be treated the same. And that same treatment is, in fact, shaft-like. It's vertical fluting. Uh, the year, the, the right-hand image is a Howells and Hood winning entry to the Tribune Tower competition, and Sullivan writes a critique of this uh, for the architectural record right after the uh, winners of the competition are announced, and he literally decries the Howells and Hood entry uh, because of its use of uh, Gothic vocabulary and Gothic details. Uh, yet, given Sullivan's uh, prescription for the tall building, it has a base, it has a vertically fluted or vertically accentuated center, and it has a very strong cap to it. The Entry that Sullivan uh, lauds is, of course, the entry by Elo Sullivan, uh, Elo Saarinen, Eliel Saarinen, sorry, which takes second place. I'm just rushing through this to avoid the 10 minute warning. Um, <laughs> and it's very clear why Sullivan so admires this building. If you, if you look at the Saarinen solution, it is literally doing everything that Sullivan asks, but by eliminating the idea of a capping element and by setting the building back, not only is its loftiness emphasized by the uh, perspectival aspect of the building setback, but it has no cap. The fluting, the, the vertical piers that go upward are, are not stopped. So the idea that this is a building which is is infinitely extendable vertically, must have appealed to Sullivan as an ultimate solution to the, pro the aesthetic problem of the tall building. And in fact, Howells and Hood uh, in 1929-1930 uh, go on to build the uh, Daily News building in New York, which is basically a stripped down, as, and Bob talked about this yesterday, a stripped down version of that idea uh, where the uh, vertical shafts seem to set back and then seem to uh, continue. Okay, if we can shift gears now, uh, I'd like to talk about Chicago's other influential tradition, which is the idea of architectural space, uh, which I've called space actualized or made, made real. Okay, and uh, Again, because it's Chicago, I think I should quote Mies van der Rohe, who said, the architect, architecture is the will of the epoch translated into space. And the whole idea of continuous space, which we now associate with modern architecture, 
was actually a development of late 19th century residential architecture in America as a response to uh, changing, uh, changing culture and changing ways in which people wanted to live in their houses and use their buildings. But the idea of continuous architectural space becomes one of the ideological cornerstones of European uh, modernism. So I want to talk briefly about Chicago's two most important 20th century residential architects, Howard Van Doren Shaw, who I've recently completed a book about, and Frank Lloyd Wright, who were contemporaries. And they both developed the idea of the continuity of interior space, of, a sp of spatial complexity that is interlocking or intersecting uh, uh, spaces, uh, the extension of interior space to the exterior, and, the, and uh, uh, those things would actually become among the most important architectural ideas of the 20th century. So if we look first at Wright, uh, and this is the dining room of the Ward Willits House, um, in fact, what we're looking at is a series of complex spaces which are created within the larger space. So if you look at the French doors on the left, they're opposite the, the windows and cabinetry on the right. There is in a setback. I wonder if I should use a, no, nah, I can't really use a pointer, but there is a setback then that defines a space, the center as a space within a space. The element of continuity are the flat horizontal bands that go all the way back to the, the uh, uh, the bay window, the pointed bay window at the end. In the center of the room, the, uh, uh, the decorative beaming on the ceiling actually creates uh, a vo an implied volume of space that the table is, sit, sits under and, and is fixed by in space. At the very end, that prow actually has on the ceiling uh, decorative beaming that complete the uh, the implication that that bay is in fact part of a volume of space. If we look at uh, the uh, Carpenter House by Howard Van Doren Shaw, we're looking at, at a space of equal complexity. If you can, if you can follow this, uh, oh, I don't think I can do this. But if you look at the plan on the, on, in the upper right, you see that you come in to a six-sided entry hall uh, which is blown out on one side, and the definition or the completion of, of that sixth side is created by the flat surface of the vault. And that vault continues over a screen wall, which is made out of leaded glass doors, to a morning room facing east, and then to a porch, and then to the outside garden. So what that vault is doing spatially is it's connecting all the way from the point of entry out to the landscape. The element of continuity, much like uh, in the right dining room we saw, is in fact the, um, the uh, lower cornice with its dentals that's, that wraps around that space but dives or tucks into the alcove which is created uh, under the vault by the uh, uh, screen wall of glass doors uh, and then runs across that space as a flying beam and then comes back. And then in the uh, lower uh, right-hand image, you can see uh, a, a view back into the entry hall and the way in which the uh, uh, interior glass doors to the dining room and to the living room sort of pair uh, within to, to help emphasize the creation of a space within a space. Uh, in uh, Shaw's Wilson House in Hyde Park, he's creating a, a space which is equally as complex. If you look at the floor plan, maybe I'll try and do this. This is the center one. Center, center one. If you look at the floor, can you all hear me? If you look at the floor plan here, you're entering at that point the beam ceiling which is here and here is actually marking off quadrants of this square and then the corner, which was the traditional parlor, is in fact an all glass room so that it's possible to be or, or to perceive each one of those as a space but to read the whole thing as four spaces or four quadrants 
within a much larger space. Uh, just to uh, put the icing on the cake, uh, and I'm going to do this with a pointer again, if you can all hear me. Uh, we're looking at two European examples. Uh, on the left is Lutchen's Little Fagan, and on the right is Le Corbusier's Villa La Roche. They are almost identical spatial propositions. Uh, we have a large space, which here, the ceiling slides all the way back to the back wall. And in fact, we've got a little cutout in that wall to bring in light, but not to destroy the enclosure provided by that wall. There's the passerelle, which comes across. And then the element that creates a space within a space is this T-shaped wall. In the Lutchen's Little Fakum, <coughs> the similar proposition, this ceiling slides back to a back wall. There is a T, can everybody hear me? There's a T-shaped wall with cutouts. Here, Corb's T-shaped wall slides to the outside and is emphasized by the line of the ribbon windows. Uh, the uh, window wall is actually folded in to emphasize its action as a screen wall, but to also allow this reading from inside to outside. And in the Lutchen's example, the T wall, you know, we, we get the implication of that as a completed plane by the piece overhead. In the Lutchen's example, uh, we have the arch and the floor to ceiling glass bay uh, as the connection to the outside. And in the Lutchen's example, there's a hallway here with an overlook, much like the functioning, much like the uh, passerelle here. This centers over the fireplace, which is the center of the space of the room, which is defined at the lower level. And then if we turn and face in the other direction, this bay is the exact center of the larger reading of the room. So why would I show you these slides? Because, in fact, this idea of making what is now called modern or modernist space is totally independent. It's an idea. It's not part of the proposition of modern architecture as a totally abstract composition of points, lines, and planes. Okay. What I'd like to do now is, sorry about all of this, but shift gears again and talk about what I think is Chicago's other great contribution to uh, the development of American architecture, and that is uh, Chicago's urbanism. And I've subtitled it A Tradition Maligned. <coughs> Before I actually show images, what I'd like to do is to offer uh, a, a brief definition of what I mean by traditional urbanism. And uh, for me, traditional urban, urbanism is about the creation of a spatially defined public realm of streets and civic spaces. And you have to remember that <clears throat> in America, uh, with the exception of the green parks in Savannah or Penn's plan for Philadelphia, there is, unlike Europe, no tradition of spatially enclosed Pub, uh, public, of a spatially enclosed public realm. Uh, town, town greens are, in fact, parks with freestanding buildings, the city hall, church, courtyard, uh, positioned around them. Chico uh, it's my contention that Chicago, in fact, pioneered the development of traditional urban spaces uh, in America. <coughs> So we have the World's Fair, which Bob talked about a little bit with respect to the Court of Honor. <clears throat> and again, I wanted to uh, quote from Lou Sullivan from the Autobiography of an Idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's writing about the World's Fair, and he says, quote, the work completed, the gates were thrown open on the 1st of May, 1893. The crowds flowed in from every quarter. Those crowds were astonished. They held what they beheld what for them was an amazing revelation of the architectural art <clears throat> of which previously they, in comparison, had known nothing. To them, it was a veritable apocalypse, a message inspired on high. Upon it, their imagination shaped new ideals. And in fact, this was the case, along with Burnham's plan for Chicago, 
This was the beginning of the City Beautiful movement, which gave us grand civic spaces in many of, or per perhaps all of Chicago's, uh, uh, all of America's uh, major cities. Of course, <clears throat> I've taken the Sullivan quote just slightly out of context, because two pages later, <clears throat> Sullivan goes on to say that the damage wrought by the World's Fair will last for half a century from, the, from its date. But he's talking about the classicism of the fair. He's not talking about the urbanism of the fair. And overlaid on that, I would argue, <clears throat> was uh, Sullivan's belief that Richardsonian Romanesque constituted the first original American vernacular. So on the upper left-hand side is John Wellborn Root, Daniel Burnham's partner's initial sketches for the fair, and Root envisioned the fair as a Romanesque construction. Uh, next to it uh, is uh, Henry Ives Cobb's uh, uh, fisheries building, and then, of course, Lewis Sullivan's. Hmm? Oh, I haven't changed the slide. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I'm looking at two at a time on the screen, so. So, and then next to that is Sullivan's uh, transportation building, and then on the bottom, of course, is the arched, the famed arched entryway to Sullivan's transportation building, and I've just placed it next to Richardson's Romanesque entryway to uh, Seaver Hall at Harvard. So you can understand that the idea of the arch as something that echelons back in space is in fact uh, 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 straight out of the, uh, out of the Romanesque. <clears throat> of course, there's then Burnham's plan done for the Commercial Club for Chicago, which gives us a grand vision of Chicago and, its, and the development of its lakefront as a center to the city, as a, a chain of parks and open space, uh, as a relief to the city, and then the idea that one can take the ubiquitous American city of, of grid extended equally in every direction and actually make it hierarchical by creating within it important places and then by, as, as LaFont had done at Washington DC, the introduction of diagonals that actually allow you to shortcut, in a sense, from one point to another. So we owe uh, the Burnham plan, even though we don't have its, uh, thank you so much, even though we don't have the great dome city hall, uh, we owe the development, the further development of the boulevard uh, system that runs through the city and, uh, and the idea of the waterfront. <clears throat> if we then look at a tradition or history of urbanism, I want to come back to Howard Van Doren Shaw's Market Square. Bob talked about it briefly. The thing that knocks me out about Market Square is, is not so much the fact that it was planned to accommodate the automobile, uh, which it says in the uh, citation of the place as a uh, historic, national historic landmark, but the fact that it was conceived as a civic point of arrival and entry into the town of Lake Forest. When you take the train, the Northwestern, which is now the Metro, <clears throat> to Lake Forest, you are on outbound on the west side of the track. So that in Lake Forest, when you got off the train, this is how you entered into Lake Forest. And what kind of knocks me out are the two clock towers, the one on the left, the south, with a clock, the one on the right, facing south, with a sundial. But they are literally uh, uh, super-scale gateposts marking a point of entry into the suburb. And just so you won't think that I'm making this up, they are in fact acting very much like the freestanding columns uh, to the Piazzetta, which was the entryway to San Marco. And of course, uh, when this was built, everybody got there by water. You just didn't bother making your way through the uh, streets of Venice. Uh, you, you probably couldn't find San Marco. You would have gotten lost. But the image below it is uh, uh, something that Howard Van Dorn Shaw does a lot, and it is the entry to the courtyard and raised terrace of the uh, Marx House 
in Akron, Ohio, where he has deployed two freestanding columns, much like the Piazzetta, to mark that point of transition or that point of entry. And this is something that we see happening in Chicago and part of the understanding of traditional urbanism that existed. So we're looking here on the right at Sullivan's Auditorium building and then remarkably at a paired piece, which is the Clinton J. Warren <coughs> building for what is now the Pitt Congress Hotel. And what Warren has done is he's picked up on the massing, but he's also picked up on the scalar breakdown and window arrangements of the Sullivan building so that lest we miss the fact that these are gateways, markers on either side of what Burnham designated as the major axis of the city of Chicago, that is Congress Street Expressway, uh, you know, you, you literally can't miss it. Uh, the other sort of amazing piece of urbanism that we have is the, the 1932 expansion of the main post office, which is now derelict, but when it was expanded, it was expanded in a way that left an opening underneath it for the extension of Congress, Park, uh, Congress Parkway, which is now actually uh, uh, almost the Corbusian entry to a city. It's this big linear mega building that we drive through the cornfields. Well, it's not cornfields, it's low scale buildings at this point, but you, you drive in on the highway, you pass on, under this urban scale wall <coughs> and suddenly you're in a very dense part of the city. <coughs> the second part of all of this that I'd like to talk about is the idea of skyscraper urbanism and I've subtitled it a tradition abandoned and I'll get to that a little bit later. But, um, Chicago's acknowledged contribution to 20th century uh, architecture is the development of the skyscraper. And there's this wonderful book called uh, The uh, Architect's Handbook of Civic Art, in which the authors Hagman and Pete say, the intelligent use of the skyscraper in civic design will be America's most valuable contribution to the civic art. Well, what in the world are they talking about? So we have all of these kind of wonderful examples in Chicago of very large skyscraper scale buildings creating civic space and creating traditional urbanism. And the end of LaSalle Street, which, which terminates on the Board of Trade, is such a unique condition within a gridded city where the grid is actually discontinuous <clears throat> that it's worth examining. And I'm not only interested in the way in which the massing of the uh, Hollibird and Root Board of Trade terminates the street. Generally, uh, buildings were extruded into cruciforms and then central towers in setback massing. But here we get a setback that actually receives the visual axis. The street is held, but I want to call your attention to the two bank buildings done by Graham Anderson, Probst, and White on either side uh, of that space. They are set back just slightly, and what they do is they pair classical temple fronts to create a strong axis, and with just that slight setback, you have a sense of arrival in an actual space, which is, n which is not simply a continuation of of the street walls. The image on the left-hand side is really interesting. It's Graham Anderson, Probst and White having done the two buildings on the east and west side of LaSalle Street, proposing to do the Board of Trade and to uh, give us one more temple front. Uh, to understand better what that space is like, these, I think, two images suggest the way in which the sort of pairing or bookending of the space to create a cross axis. And then finally, the lower face of the Board of Trade actually make this into an urban space. Um, we looked at gateway conditions uh, on uh, Congress Street Expressway as you come to the park for the Auditorium Theater and the Pitt Congress Hotel. We're in what is actually a kind of unique building by Holliburton Roche because they not only built 
this building, but they built the Monroe Building next door. They're unusual skyscrapers in that a lot of space is invested in the roof, and the buildings pair, in a sense, because of the peaked roofs to create that kind of gateway uh, experience as a, as a way to come to the lake from the city or to enter from the park to the city itself. Um, what we're looking at here is Andrew Rabori's scheme for uh, the development of North Michigan Avenue. And the thing to remember <coughs> is that Michigan, North Michigan Avenue wasn't always there. It was a thing called Pine Street. And in fact, uh, there was nothing there but houses and a few com small commercial buildings really until the Michigan Avenue Bridge was built. Uh, the one exception to that, of course, is the Wrigley Building, which predates the bridge, but uh, what I've always been kind of knocked out by is that Rabori proposes in this detail these two paired towers, which end up looking remarkably like uh, the image on the right-hand side, which is the House and Hood a winning competition entry for the Tribune Tower. But what I want to talk about now is this point in the city, which is created by a number of different architects, but which actually involves a collaboration of the understanding of civic and public space. So if we look at a plan of the space, what you can see is that the first building there, maybe I'll, I'll do this with the pointer as well. So the first building there uh, is in fact sorry, is in fact the Wrigley Building here, and it's actually peeled back on an angle which corresponds to the center line of the Chicago River at the point where it bends. The tribute, it, it in a way sets up the Tribune Tower almost as a sort of marker of the real beginning of Michigan Avenue, and then we'll look at also the buildings on the south side uh, of that space. And there's a little, uh, little history here of really the, the sequence of those buildings. So unlike Rockefeller Center, which is one of the great pieces of ur American urbanism, but was in fact a team of architects who collaborated on the creation of and, under, uh, and development of that space, this is something that the architects just brought to the table as an understanding of the place where they were building. So on the south side, we've actually got the London Guarantee Building, which instead of rounding the corner, actually has a curving face, which begins to suggest, in fact, that we are actually in some sort of large-scale urban space where the bridge occurs and where the river turns. Uh, we're also, how did I get to, huh, I think I skipped a slide. Okay, that's the slide I skipped, which is a, a, so it gives you a better idea of what the curvy face of the London Guarantee Building does. But what I'm interested in here is, like the Board of Trade, the 333 North Michigan Building is understood as being a point tower at the end of a visual line of sight. And because of the development of Michigan Avenue and then Pine Street, which becomes North Michigan Avenue, and the misalignment, the bridge actually comes at a slight angle, which means that when you are coming down Michigan Avenue, the center of your view down Michigan Avenue is the end of 333, which presents itself as a, as a slender point tower, but is in fact the development of the end of what is actually a, a, a slab building. Well, the short of the matter is that probably nobody knows Saarinen's entry to the Tribune Tower competition, but everybody knows that Adolf Bloch's entry, which is this sort of mega-scale Doric column. And it's a mystery. It's a total mystery. How do we explain that? Well, the way to explain it is that Bloch had actually been to Chicago. So he understood the importance of that site and the way that site, the 
as the tribune tower would function in the urbanism of that place. And simultaneously, we understand that in 1922, does anybody know where A.F. Rose was living? He was in Paris. So it's my contention that he saw that tri the, his Tribune Tower entry as a kind of gatepost that would mark the point of entry to North Michigan Avenue. And in fact, it bears an interesting comparison to Seattle Dew's projects for gateposts for the city of Paris. Okay. The, the whole idea of large buildings creating an urbanism, we can even see in the work of Mies van der Rohe. And the quote from uh, Mies in America, edited by Phyllis Lambert, that says the Federal Center was like most of Mies's work, carefully studied in relation to the built context and the program. I had a teaching colleague who worked in Mises' office at that point in time who said that Mies would come in, that he had these models of the buildings for the Federal Center built, and then he used to move them around and then sit literally for hours and contemplate them. It wasn't until I actually saw photographs of those models that I realized that they weren't just models sitting on the site, that there was an entire context model, and that Mies in the positioning, and I can't, can never remember the names of the buildings, but in the positioning of the South Building was in fact defining the space because the space would have been chopped up by the short ends of the Monadnock Building and the Union League Club. And I actually think that the Federal Center is a really interesting piece of traditional urbanism because the slab buildings are big enough to define two sides of the space. The old Chicago buildings define and enclose the other sides of the space. And then Mies positions the post office ostensibly as an object in the space, but it's actually 20 feet high, which means that as you walk across the plaza and approach it, suddenly the buildings here go away and you're actually in a smaller scale space which is created by, Mies, by the sign of Mises post office, the, Mar the Marquette building and then the other buildings of the Federal Center. Of course it's been pointed out that, that the Federal Center is one end of a series of urban plazas of which the Civic Center is the other end and again uh, C.F. Murphy and Jack Bronson's building is big enough that in conjunction with the building surrounding it, it defines this big open space. And the thing you have to remember about these spaces is that they're conceived as being civic within the context of the city. So think St. Peter's Square. Think the Nevsky Prospect. Uh, uh, of course, without tanks and people <laughs> do stuff. And, uh, but you know, years ago, it occurred to me that the thing that was missing from Daly's Daily Seniors uh, Civic Center was in fact a second floor balcony. <laughs> where you could just step out on occasions and bless what was, uh, what was going on. Uh, so powerful was the da uh, Senior Daily and the Daily Dynasty. So if we move forward in time, because the, the, the theme of this symposium is uh, uh, the continuance of the tradition, is it in fact something that has contemporary meaning or is it simply an artifact? What I want to do is to look at the whole idea of the uh, late 20th century building uh, and uh, uh, what I've said is that in the second half of the 20th century the tall building comes to epitomize the freestanding anti-urban tower in the park or on a plaza which was one of the ideals of modern architecture. So I think, and I agree with Bob on this, that the high point of the Second Chicago School is in fact the Hancock Building. It's, it's, it's the perfect confluence of all the things that modern architecture forefronted as, as issues. Uh, it's, us, you know, everybody, everybody thinks it was designed by Bruce Graham, but in fact, 
it's, it's a genius building because Fosler Kahn, the engineer who figured out how to build 100-story buildings, understood that because of the wind load, that this was, in fact, a cantilever up, up from the ground rather than out over space, and that if the building was built as a tube, that is, the exterior wall acted as a continuous structure that you could use it to, to design for wind loads. So here, all of the exterior columns are tied together by the trusses uh, as an expression of structure and as real structure. The building, because it is a mixed-use building of offices on the bottom, which have a larger floor plate than the apartments on top, taper, and if you remember all of the setback skyscrapers and all of the skyscrapers that Lou Sullivan so loved tapered as an idea of loftiness and extension. Uh, the, Sears, uh, the Hancock building is sort of doing this in spades. Of course, it destroys the urbanism of Michigan Avenue by being set back. Uh, the plaza that's created there was sunken, which is an, yet another way to make it inaccessible uh, as part of the uh, public domain. Uh, the, uh, this, the Sears Tower is a thing that was described as a, a series of bundled tubes. Uh, aesthetically, uh, I think that it certainly has formal precedent. Uh, and again, uh, the original version of the plaza there wiped out 55 stores and made pink granite walls along both of the side streets uh, and was a kind of urbanistic a disaster in spite of uh, any elegance we might perceive in its form. Uh, continuing, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a proposition about the tall building as, uh, uh, as sublime or transcendental, nobody's doing it better than Chicago's Adrian Smith. This is the Burj Divai, which is the last thing he designed uh, at SOM. I've just it's compared to Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High uh, uh, as a fantasy, but they are both kind of ultimate expressions of the uh, soaring tall building. Uh, George Shipwright's uh, uh, Lake Point Towers is a kind of essay, uh, or if you will, a soft sculpture version of the wonderful prismatic uh, office buildings that Mies van der Rohe proposed in the 1920s. Uh, newer buildings that might be icons. Oh my God, I have five minutes left to go. I won't say anything about this except that it's a one-liner depending on your point of view and maybe you recall Venturi. So I want to look at uh, what's happening with space actualized uh, and I want to propose the idea of not misreading, which was thought to be a way that architects made new work based on a misunderstanding of work that came before, but the idea of rereading. And I want to look at Mises Barcelona Pavilion. So the top two images are the iconic vision of Mises Pavilion. They are continuous space channeled between uh, a series of walls. But if we look at, again, the things that nobody talks about or can explain about the Barcelona Pavilion, the, co the only piece of art in that space is, in fact, a female nude, a traditional representational piece. And I would contend that it's positioned within a, a traditionally defined and completely defined volume of space. If you, if you look at what's happening here, you get the walls completely enclosing it. You get that edge and that edge. And remember, to define volume, all you need are its edges, the lines that describe that thing in space. Uh, so this is, in fact, in the midst of all of this sort of continuous space, a, a traditionally defined space. And then, of course, there's a red curtain, right? Nobody knows what to make out of the red curtain. The reason, and you can go visit the Barcelona Pavilion, it's been reconstructed. The reason for that is that it's always open. The minute you close it, you understand that it's creating with the onyx wall that the king and the queen sat against a traditionally defined space within this larger idea of continuous space. Okay, so 
Uh, Mark Sexton is going to talk to you later today. And of all the work happening in Chicago, I think the work of Kirk Ed Sexton is the inheritor of not only the sort of tectonics of Nice and Barcelona Pavilion, the sumptuousness of its materials, but this idea of making a rich and complex vision of architectural space. Another uh, Crick and Sexton one. And then just to conclude, I'd like to look at a rereading of Meeks. And one of the things, I'm a Chicagoan. I went away, I came back to Chicago. And since I've been back here, as a practicing architect and as a historian, one asks, what is, what is my relationship to the tradition and the history of Chicago architecture? And I have always been interested in Frank Lloyd Wright and the way in which spaces are created and the way in which you read and understand those spaces depending on what all of this stuff, these bands of dark stained wood, are doing within the space. So this is a townhouse that I did many years ago. And it's we're looking at the dining room, the uh, reading of the whole narrow space of the townhouse is here. It ends in a, in a bay. The dining room is actually has an oval back wall. The front of that oval is created by the softening here. And there is, in fact, a space that goes up to the house and is skylit. The ceiling trim is an oval with its foci marked and underneath it, just like the right dining room, uh, suggesting a volume. Again, within the volume is an oval table. The, the hutch has uh, glass doors both sides into the kitchen, much like the see-through cabinet here. It's on center with an overmantel mirror in the fireplace. And then if you want privacy and you close those doors, the side walls still slide through. So for me, the, out, the outlier tradition of Chicago architecture that I've been exploring and am now exploring with my partner, Julie Hacker, for almost 30 years in our work is this idea that you can make a complex, modern, if you will, space continuous space that, that has a correspondence to the way in which people live in houses and we're residential architects, and that you can actually do it with the forms of a traditional architecture that actually carry with them uh, a, 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 the associative meaning of domesticity and comfort rather than reverting to an architecture of abstraction. Thank you.